know, uh, um, so the lecture today is going to be about path integrals and uh, uh, and their the use of what theory. Um, so I'm going to start by reminding about <coughs> reminding you how path integrals work in quantum mechanics. Okay. So suppose we we have uh, this is elementary stuff. Most of you know it. We just look at this. That's a second location. Okay. So suppose we had a quantum system with an Hamiltonian which was d squared by two n plus v of n. Uh, the canonical first quantum mechanical system anyone studies. Okay? It's the quantum mechanics of a particle moving in one dimension with canonical kinetic term of potential. Okay. Now, um, as all of you know, the evolution operator, the evolution operator in quantum mechanics is equal to my minus i h plus h times t. Okay? This is something called u of t. And it's the operator that uh, takes a state at time t1 to a state at time t1 plus t. Okay? So suppose you know your state, you know, your state is psi at uh, t t1. And you want to know what is the state psi? Uh, what is psi at t2? The answer to that question, as all of you know, is equal to power minus i. Well, it's a Schrodinger equation, h of t2 minus t1. This evolution operator is clearly a useful thing in quantum mechanics. It's the operator that allows you to translate things in time. It's the operator that allows you to ask the basic question of all physics that is given a state at any time. Thank you. Given a state at any time, what is the state at a future? Okay. Now, uh, as all of you know, uh, over what, what is it, 70 years ago now, uh, uh, Feynman came up with a very, uh, uh, very nice path integral representation of this evolution operator, uh, which we will now discuss. Okay, so this is an operator. The operator has two indices. Uh, we're going to try to represent it by a number. Uh, the only way we can do that is look at matrix elements. So let's suppose we are interested in the matrix elements of the operator e to the power minus i h t starting at x1 and ending at x2. <coughs> okay. Now, the basic idea, the key, the key idea, well, uh, the key point was this. So this, uh, that, uh, this, okay, so this is the operation that we will sometimes, uh, you know, in words say is the amplitude for propagation of, of, of the particle from x1 at time, let's say zero, to x2 at time t. Of course, I could have equally said x1 at time t1 and x2 at time t1 plus t. So this translation is invalid. Time translation is invalid. Now the key observation here is that this uh, operator um, uh, can be built out of breaking it up into operators for evolution over smaller times. And the key identity is the completeness of states of quantum mechanics. This is true always. This is just a, a true statement of a bit, uh, decomposition of the identity of the basis. Okay. So, at any point of time, we, we could rewrite this operator d to the power minus i h, uh, let's say, um, t1, t minus t1. This is trivial. I've used the fact that these two operators commute because h is the same h. And, uh, and then I can insert this identity into here. Okay? Now, once I insert that identity into here, so let's call this uh, let's call this object g of x1 to x2 in times in time t. Clearly, what we get is the identity that g of x1 to x2 in times t, by inserting this out, our identity, is equal to the integral of g of x1 to x uh, in times t1. That's g of x, uh, x to x2 in times t minus t. Is 
is a square bracket. Okay? So, this evolution operator obeys this property that if you know it for smaller times, you can build it up by, for bigger times by compounding and integrating. Okay? So then, finally, observe that since this was the case, we could try to take, try to repeat this procedure many, many, many times and build it up out of compounding infinitesimal time evolutions. Okay? So, what's the idea? Let's suppose we, we had, we had, we call this, um, okay. So, suppose uh, we define various time steps. So, let's say that for simplicity, this is a time zero notation. So we have x1 at time 0. Now we break this up in a many, many, many small time steps. Uh, let's call the first time step, uh, okay, I should have called this T1 because in conflict with my notation, let me call it U. And then these d 
is a genius that is a product of Okay? So what we have is a, is a product of n factors of evolution because we've broken up the time interval into n little sub intervals. But because we've broken up n little sub intervals, there are n minus 1 intermediate uh, intermediate positions. And we have to integrate over those intermediate positions. Okay, this is an obvious thing. And uh, uh, Feynman's main, uh, main, uh, main, main insight is following up by, by an observation by Dirac uh, was um, that when this thing is infinitesimal, I mean, each of these infinitesimal guys are rather easy to compute. So let's go ahead and compute. So, what we want to do is to compute this evolution operators. We want us to compute, let's say, B e to the power minus i h delta p and then when delta t is now some infinitesimal object, we want to work to first order in Okay? And the clever way to do this computation goes as follows. Um, the first thing to do, um, I rubbed out this h, but you remember, it's p squared by 2m plus p of x. And the first thing to do is to remember that in general, you cannot, you know, it's not true that uh, e to the power of p squared by 2m plus p of x, in general, uh, times of t, is not equal to e to the power <coughs> minus i times p squared by 2m t times e to the power minus i times p of x. See, this is <coughs> not true. Uh, the reason is that p squared and p of x is commute. Okay? However, and this is what makes the finite evolution difficult to evaluate that much in the non-commuting nature that is operated. Okay. However, uh, if this t was an infinitesimal, the lack of computation is expressed by the Campbell Baker House law of identity. Uh, and it involves the commutator of this operator, p squared by 2 x times t, with v of x times t, the first correction involves that. And that's of order t squared. Okay? So if we're only keeping terms to order delta t, we can ignore the fact that these two operators will compute. Okay? So you can write it as a product of two different. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to write this as follows. And you can write it in any order. The difference again is proportional commutator. So let's write this as a b e to the power minus i uh, of v of x times delta t h cross e to the power minus i h cross uh, p squared times one. Valid to first order infinity. Okay? Then the next step is to say, well, this is really easy. Because, as you know, it's a property of any function of the operator x acting on an eigenstate of x. You just replace that function by the value of x. Okay? So this is equal to v to the power minus i times plus v of p delta t times v e to the power minus i times h cross p squared to m, t, and then. Okay? And now, p is a bit irritating to compute in the position basis. It's easier to compute it in a momentum basis. So let's, let's insert. Let's, let's insert a complete set of states, but using the momentum basis. So this is p, e to the power minus i by h cross, p squared by 2m, delta t, p, p, a, integral db, times this one. Okay? Now that we've got, we've moved to the momentum basis, this is trivial to compute, because here we just act this operator p, and we replace it by number p, so that is equal to e to the power minus i, p squared delta p by um, h cross 2 h cross m, uh, times 
Now, what's this? Inner product of B with B. An inner product of B of B with A. So this is equal to either bar I H bar B of A minus B. Because the inner product of B with A is equal to bar H bar B minus A. Ah, that's right, e to the bar I H bar B A. Because the weight function, this is this just represents ah, I did it properly. This is something. This is just the, the wave function of the momentum I can state in position basis. If by H B. And this is the complex case. <coughs> okay? So, what if we finally concluded? Uh, we finally concluded that uh, we have e to the power minus i b squared delta j by 2h power m times uh, i plus i h power uh, b into b minus h power should be in the dimension in the in the here thank you
this h bar m by delta t. In this case, the determinant is just the determinant of a number. So 1 over square root of uh, h by m. Okay, in, sorry. It is equal to square root of h by m by delta t. Okay, times of pi business coming from e to the power minus. Some, 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 some numbers. Okay, times just solving for the equation of motion for p and plugging that back in. Is this familiar to you? Okay, so so I, I won't bother to evaluate the Gaussian integral. I just use the fact that I know what the answer will be up to normalization, which we will probably never need in this course. We're going to make one statement. So I'm going to ignore all this. Why is B appearing here rather than I know appearance of B? Why is B appearing here? You see, that's because I broke symmetry by inserting the complete set of states here rather than here. Okay, and uh, uh, we have to remember that all of these expressions are uh, approximate. That is, they're valid only to first order and delta t. Okay, so to this first order and delta t, as we will soon see, b and a will always be forced to be infinitesimally nearby. Okay, so it won't make a difference. You see, what we're going to do is to get what we're breaking and doing is breaking up this path integral into steps. And whether you use the potential here or the potential here, when the steps are taken to be very small, it doesn't really make a difference. Because it's all going to be small. The parts in which these, these steps are finitely separated will contribute to each other. Surprise. So, sir, for higher orders, this won't be valid, right? Higher orders in delta t? Delta t this won't be valid. But you see, we never need a higher order in delta t. We're doing it. What we're doing is like a, you know, it's like an integral. Uh, if you think about how you, you know, how you sum an area on that curve, you got this, and you say, well, what's the, what's the, what's the answer? It's the height here times the distance. Now you could ask, no, 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 why, why not the height here times the distance? And you're right, you know, this is an approximation. Say the height here times the distance, or the height here times the distance. They're all approximations. Okay, but the point is that the error you make scales like delta t squared or delta x squared. Okay. And you can take the limit, delta x goes to zero. So it doesn't matter. It's the same kind of thing that's going to happen. Okay? There's an error if delta t was finite. But in the limit that we'll be interested in, we don't care about those things. Okay, see, the usual thing. Okay, great. So, uh, so now just you know substitute uh, just using what we know, what we have again is that this is simply e to the power i by h times the action, which it was simply the action we started with, which was x dot uh, m x dot squared by uh, by two. X dot remember is code for b minus a. Uh, b minus a. Okay, minus v of b. The whole thing. At this point, this one. Times and it's times a constant normalization factor, which will be of no importance to more, for much of much of what I can say. Is it? Is this clear? Okay. So we've got okay. And now we take this. We take this formula together with the, with the formula we derived earlier in this lecture about how you uh, take the evolution operator and decompose it up into a product. And we remember that the product of exponentials is the sum upstairs. Okay? So we have derived the formula that g of xi to xf in times t in times t is equal to Part integral e to the power i by h cross s dt m x dot squared by 2 minus v of x. And in this derivation, we also have precise meanings for this dx and this action. What does this dx mean? This dx just means uh, this dx is just product. Because again, from the product formula, uh, dx1 to dx in minus 1. Sorry? No, now everything is a number. You see, this is some number. Okay? Numbers are the same. Okay? So all the operator stuff. 
stuff was dealt with here. Now we look at a matrix element. Matrix element is a number. And now we just process numbers and numbers are processed. Okay? Uh, okay. Uh, now what, what does this mean? This is product of this times the factors that we got by doing this integral here. I'm not keeping track of that. Okay? So times the normalization. But you can easily keep track of that if you want. You see, right? It's just some pi's and factors of i and square root of h by m by by right, that is. Okay? That's what this dx means. Uh, what does this action mean? This action just means the action for each interval added up. It's just this object added up over an interval. Okay? We've, sorry, just one, one last statement. We've got n intervals for n minus 1 integration variables. The two n points supply the data need to complete the evaluation of the action. Uh, well, I think the, the argument of the exponential is taking the limit of everything tends to zero, right? right. But uh, your normalization factor will go. Right? Will go. So, normally, how do you go around that? How do you go around that? You see, what, as you can see, what people always be interested in is the ratios in which the normalization will be. Yes. Okay? However, um, However, this is a clip answer. Uh, because it's not totally satisfying. Often in physics, you don't feel totally satisfied unless you can control it. And uh, that's a good insight. Um, now, yeah, there's a better answer to the question. Um, maybe I'll think that is one of the first assignments. I'll ask you guys to look at it. Okay. The better answer is that if you want to account for this normalization, okay, you can do it by starting with a renormalization. Okay. You know, it's often said that in quantum mechanics there's no renormalization. And that's true for everything non trivial, but there is a sense in which the action you have to use here is not quite the classic action, but includes what's called a counter term. And the inclusion of this counter term cancels this infinite. Um, I won't try to explain it here, but I'll, 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 I'll give you an assignment if you first want to Actually, Fulchinsky may, may work this. I think he works this. So, what, what, the, the, the canonical way to answer this question is to just work out the path integral for the harmonic oscillator. Okay? And to work it out, including these extra terms. Okay, I'll do okay. it. <coughs> Uh, so two answers. The first one is, is that we never need really to answer your question. Okay? Uh, the second one is we can, but I won't take the time. Okay. Um, a good, very good question. Yes. Nothing, uh, nothing I said here would have changed v of x was a function of v of x. Nothing. Okay? Except that, you know, we would have to be careful in the notation. It wouldn't be the product of the same operator all the time. You know, what we would. So, so, yeah, you, you might be worried here. You might be worried by saying, that, look, you started off saying that you can break this up because uh, because the operators commute. And then if V of X is functional, then they no longer commute. I mean, you see, that is a great hit. Because what is the right evolution operator? You have to start with the right object. What is the right evolution operator? In quantum mechanics, but V is a function of time. So, tell me. Path order, time order, right, exactly. It can be formally written as this, this object. You know, path order e to the power r minus i h of t. Okay? Uh, now, this is a formal object. It's a Okay? This is a formal object. It's a P here, is very important. What is it? What it means is exactly what we're doing in the part. That is, break up this evolution operator into evolutions over little time steps and multiply the corresponding operators. You see, where does that come from? It comes from the fact that over any infinitesimal time, no operator is time dependent. Okay? So, the general principle about inserting complete set of states works even for time dependence. 
So this, the general formula that you can break it up into infinitesimal evolutions doesn't care about that. Okay, and the object that you know the, the object that we wanted was this path order object, which was the product of the infinitesimal evolution operators by definition. So that's the object we started with. And then just between these infinitesimal operators, we insert complete steps. So everything. No more difference. Yes. You said that uh, we cancel the infinity in the n by adding counter terms and all that. Right. But I, that should be wrong, right? Because I would assume that the infinity in the n cancels the fact that we have infinite integrations going on. We have infinite integrations. But if you cancel the infinity in the n, you'd have an infinity in the numerator and that would be done. It's taken as a limiting process, so you'll have two factors which come out and cancel. Yeah. Then the limit is probably yeah. yeah. No, no, but what you're saying is correct. What you're saying is correct. See, there are basically two ways of doing this. If you are, if, of course, see, no, actually, what you're saying, what you're saying is correct. Okay. See, if you just do exactly what I did, okay, if you just do exactly what I did, then I started with a well defined object. So I'll end up with it. And the infinities will cancel for the reason that you said. Okay. But, uh, okay. So, so, you say, right, that I will draw my statement. Sorry, that was wrong. What I said. Now, let me tell you what I, what I meant to say. Okay. What I meant to say was the following. Um, you know, in order to keep track of these normalization constants exactly the way I put it, okay, is often very painful. Okay. Often, what you do is the following. Okay. Often, what you end up, what you actually do is the following. Um, see, suppose I wanted some evolution from uh, x initial to x prime. Suppose I wanted this evolution from x initial to x prime. Uh, what you can do is to look at the set sum over all parts as a classical path plus fluctuations and integrate over the fluctuations. Okay, no approximation. Okay, now the big difference is that between the, since the, since the classical path already has the right boundary conditions, the fluctuations are a problem with boundary conditions 0 and 0 at the initial parameters. Okay, now. Uh, let's suppose we work on, let's say, the Harmon concept. So what would we be doing? We would be looking at paths. We would be doing some path integral over fluctuations. Okay? We would be doing a path integral over fluctuations, um, uh, starting out at time 0, ending up at time t, with the boundary condition that x is 0 at time 0, and 0 at time t. Okay? Now, uh, there is a convenient basis for such functions. The basis is sine functions with the right periodic. Okay? And what you can show is that this measure that I do, just my formal Jacobian time, okay, uh, is the same thing as the following. Suppose I take x of t and write it as sum over a n times the sine n times y. Then this measure dx1 times dx n minus 1, okay, is the same thing as the prop as measure d a n for our two. No, without. Okay. And now, because I've ignored it on this issue, now it's no longer true. Okay. Now it's no longer true that uh, um, that uh, uh, the path integral that I started with is exactly what I wanted to compute. It's true of the normalization. Okay. So if I do define the path integral in this manner, okay, then I will need to add a counter. Okay? And this is often the operational definition of the path integral. Uh, just because that object is a bit tricky to get to, to work with. Okay? So I'm sorry, what I said was wrong in, initially. This is the correct version of it. This is the problem I had in my mind. Okay. Yeah, I, in this case, it's basically a vacuum energy component. It's a trivial one. In quantum field theory, when we, when we understand these things, everything will be less trivial. We come. They don't come just from these trivial things about changing a path integral into a. They come from more interesting things. We'll, we'll come. 
Okay. Uh, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Great. Uh, so uh, we we take we've been able to take this evolution operator and represent it as the path integral. Um, and the path integral took this nice familiar form. There's this uh, the sum over all parts weighted by e to the pi times exponential of the action. All of you know this, of course. Well, this was a review. Okay. Um, any questions about this before we we'll immediately start applying these ideas now to quantum field theory? Uh, but any questions? Okay. Uh, so let's let's start. Now, <coughs> everything. Path ordering what we normally call time ordering or something Path ordering is same time. Yeah. Uh, the path is just a, an evolution in time. Okay. You can consider other evolutions. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. 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 But, but it's the path order exponential. Yeah. So, where the notation you use, what you mean is product of infinitesimal evolutions. Yeah. As long as we agree on that. Okay. Um, excellent. So let's keep going. So now, everything I said here would apply, would, would work for two particles. Everything I said here would work for any particles moving in any number of dimensions. Okay? I just worked one particle for notational simplicity. Nothing dependent on it. Okay? So any, any action of this form with arbitrary numbers. Okay. Any action of the general form, suppose you start with the classical action of the general form, a i j x i dot x j dot, okay, plus b of x i uh, d t. Okay. okay, everything we said would go through without basically without modification. Okay. You just, I wouldn't need more notation in the complete set of states, but tables for each of the frameworks. Okay. Um, now, in quantum field theory, we often end up studying such actions. Uh, so let's start with the simplest, the simplest action one that you're familiar with, uh, one that we studied in your earlier courses. Suppose we started with an action which was the following it's the action for a scale of. So, uh, okay, let's set conventions. Let's choose in this course to work with the mostly positive convention for the action. So eta is minus one, 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 one. Okay? And there are advantages to either convention, but we try our best to the extent that we can get conventions right. We try our best to stick to this convention. Okay? So now, what is the kinetic term for the scalar of field? Well, because the time part is so I'll write down the music with me. It's d mu phi, d mu phi. Right. This is the correct kinetic term. Because if you work it out in terms of phi dot, this will have a positive phi dot space. And that's the rule for actions. Actions are going to give rise to unitary one scales. Always come with positive kinetic term. Like x dot squared. Okay? <laughs> Moreover, now the position space. So, so this is equal to phi dot squared by two minus uh, l i phi squared by two. Hmm. So both things are satisfying. First, that the kinetic term is positive. Second, that the term that is purely potential is negative over positive infinite quantity. Okay. So the thing that we identify as v of x is del i phi squared by two, which is positive. Here to start with some minus v of phi. Okay. The minus v of phi will most of what we do be phi to the form. But at the formal level that we're going to work, you know, it won't matter. Okay. Now, 
This is a beautiful lens in Mary and Okay? But just for intermediate steps, I'm going to do something uh, that no physicist, no theoretical physicist likes to do. This is more the symmetry of the problem by working with a particular slicing. <laughs> so I choose some particular choice of time, whatever that is. And I slice up my path integral according to that slice of time. That slice of time. With that choice of time, the action is what we have written. It's plus phi i dot, sorry, phi of x dot squared by 2 my, uh, minus del i phi of x squared by 2 minus v of phi. And this is d dx. We're working in some d dimension. Uh, space time. Okay. Now, you know, this looks a little confusing because we've got a continuous number of degrees of freedom. But, in order to make sense of this theory, we can imagine regulating it by a sort of lattice type of thing. Okay? So imagine that x is not continuous but discrete. We'll eventually take the spacing to zero. That's basically what we mean by this thing. Okay? Then, what we've got, um, what, and uh, uh, imagine also for a moment that we put the whole theory on a spatial norms. Okay? Then, this action, this, this action here is exactly the Sorry, it's exactly this one. With the xi's, the role of the xi's being played by phi of the various discretized spatial units. Is this clear? Since our derivation of the path integral went through for any action of, of this form, I put it on a torus just so that for a finite number of degrees. Okay. We'll eventually take the torus to the largest Okay. Since it's true for any action of this form, it's true also for this action. So without further ado, we conclude that the evaluation operator for what we feel today, just like in quantum mechanics, okay, is given by e to the power i times minus d mu of phi, d mu of phi by 2 minus d of phi. <laughs> now let's be a bit careful. <coughs> um, d phi. Okay? This, this is low end, I mean, this is x position at the time. Okay? So, what do we mean? You see, what do we mean by this? What do I mean, we mean by all these quantities? This quantity is pretty clear. It's the action. What we mean by this quantity here is a path integral over phi at various time positions and at every space position. You see, because space now plays the role of the label. So you have to do the path integral over each of the label variables. So each spatial point. And then space, you know, the, space, the uh, time is discretized according to the velocity of the path integral. Okay? So the way that this, we make sense of this, imagine that you've got a grid in space time. Okay? The spatial positions of this grid are this i index. The time positions are what we did before. Okay? We have to take an a product of integrals over each time. But for every variable. So that means the product of integrations over every point on the screen in space time. Okay? So that's what uh, that's what we denote formally by this path integral set. It's the integral over all functions of space and time. And notice something quite beautiful has happened. Two beautiful things have happened. Even though we started, you know, we took this nice, beautiful, classical Lorentz <coughs> integral, and in order to try to set up some evolution operator, okay, in order to set up some evolution operator, we broke the Lorentz invariance of the problem by choosing a time slice. The final answer we gained, uh, we gained the Lorentz. You see, the measure involves product over all fields and all points of space as well as time. Basically, not distinguishing between space and time. Okay? 
and the action was the action on which, unlike the Hamiltonian, for instance, is manifestly related to it. Okay. Now, what do I mean by this evolution operator? What do I mean by this evolution operator? The evolution operator is, you know, is uh, is precisely uh, as it was in quantum, quantum mechanics. If we want to know what is the amplitude, okay. So, uh, as as we've discussed um, in quantum field theory as in quantum mechanics, we've got a Hilbert space. I should have said this. Or clearly, let me say or clearly. Uh, in quantum mechanics, the problem we discussed, we had a simple Hilbert space. The Hilbert space of square integral functions of x. Okay. If we generalize this quantum mechanics to this problem, we have where i is equal to. We also have an i set of this, the inverse space of square integral functions of the m variables uh, x of i, x1, x2, up to xn. Okay? Now, once again in quantum field theory, at least with this discretized, once we've discretized, we've got a Hilbert space. The Hilbert space is the, is the uh, we will see different ways of looking at it. Uh, since you've done a lot of Fourier analysis in your quantum field theory one, you already know many different ways of looking at it. But one conceptual way of looking at it is just square integrable functions of phi at each point in space. Square integrable functionals of phi. What's a functional? A functional is an object that takes a function and outputs it. Okay? So for every value of this function, you have some number. For instance, an integral is a function. You've given a function, you associate a number with it. Okay? So square integral, so Schrodinger away functions of quantum field theory are functionals of phi of spatial x. That have some square integrable properties. Okay? This is the inverse space of the of the theory, just static community, canonical definition and canonical framework after you describe. Okay, and uh, now just like you had position eigenstates, position eigenstates x, which have the property that the operator x acting on x is number x acting on x, uh, you have position eigenstate states phi of x, which have the property that the operator phi of x acting on this. Uh, is equal to pi x. Notice that the Hilbert spaces at distinct points in position are distinct Hilbert spaces. And that the operators pi of x at different positions on a given time slice all commute to each because they are operators that act on different Hilbert spaces. Okay? So it is possible to simultaneously diagonalize the operators because they don't commute. Meaning simultaneous meaning at all points in X. And so there is one wave, one basis state such that phi of X and any X on that phi of X is the a particular function of X. Is this clear or was my notation too confusing? If this is I'm sorry, I said this in a very confusing way, I know. It was unclear to anyone, please. Uh, so do you also need to put in the in the phi of that phi of X needs to be square integral? Yes, you would need to do that. You would need to do that. So this uh, for a wave, this wave functional is a wave functional on uh, the Hilbert space is that of square integrable, uh, square integrable wave functionals. Okay, uh, and we will do this automatically in the way we actually use this by going to the um, Yes. Any other questions? Is what I'm saying here? Do you understand what I mean by this state in quantum field theory? Requiring that the wave function is square integrable, does it uh, put some sort of restriction on the kind of three configurations it can have? Yeah, yeah, right. It will, it's very much like in quantum mechanics. Um, basically, you will not, you see, what does it mean, roughly, roughly speaking, in quantum mechanics? What does it mean that the wave function is square integrable? More or less, it means that it dies out at infinity. Okay? That's the same kind of thing that's going to happen. That the functional has no support when phi is taken to be to infinity in any at any x. Roughly speaking. Yes? 
you have to do this more carefully as a major issue. Say. Kill yourself with this problem. But roughly, this is the this case. Is and then it doesn't blow up if the field goes to infinity anyway. This dies off every, every infinite time. Roughly, that's what we do. Okay, now, of course, you know, if there's. Uh, uh, I sometimes give courses to, to in places where mathematicians also attend. And then you get in real trouble through all of this. Because you say that the inverse space is square integral, and then you use these x's, which, as you know, what the big n is, are not square integral. Because you square the delta function, you integrate it, you get infinity. Okay, and, okay so let's, uh, let's put all that aside. Sure. <laughs> okay. You know what I mean, right? You know, most of these things cancel out. Places where, you don't, where they don't cancel out, uh, usually it's the physics that helps you understand why it doesn't. Sorry, but uh, at each point you said there is an inverse space or over Yes, point? at each point there is an inverse space. Uh, so, how do I find out the dimension of that inverse space? Uh, how do I find out different states of that inverse space at, at each point? At each point, the inverse space is simply <coughs> obtained by the harmonic oscillator. You see, at each point we've got an inverse space, which is square integrable functions of phi of that value. Exactly like right? Hmm. Uh, no, no. You see, when we talk about Hilbert spaces, we always slice it. Oh, yeah. These are like. You see, Hilbert space, think about one again. A Hilbert space is not defined in, in time, it's defined once in time. That's the same thing we're happening. So, we take time slice, so at each point in space. Okay. Now, I don't need to give it time slice. Uh, Sasha is not set. I'm mm -hmm. happy with something. Go so, uh, so if I want to find out, I, I have to quantize, or I have to say, uh, I mean, in terms of, you said that the harmonic oscillator, I will be able to find out. Is that just? No, go, go on. Sorry, but what, so how do I find out the number of states? Number of states is infinite. Yeah, number of states is infinite. And, uh, I mean, how do I say precisely what are my states? What, what are your states? Yeah. See, suppose we did between, we take this thing, and on a lap, we take space and break it up into a Let's say space is one dimension that I can draw on the board. Okay? So there's x1, x2, up to xn. Let's say we're on tall, so xn is an n. Okay? So what is our Hilbert space? Our Hilbert space are just square integrable wave functions of phi of x1, phi of x2, to phi of xn. Okay? Now, uh, what's the Hilbert space? Now, uh, uh, if you want to specify one way of specifying a state, one way of specifying the state is just to specify a wave function like that. Some functional of phi of x1, phi of x2, phi of x1. Now suppose we're doing three things. They want to know what is the specification of the vacuum. In fact, it is a, a function of this form that you can easily write down. Okay? But of course, this is not a convenient basis for specifying the vacuum or any reasonable state. Because the, while the Hilbert spaces are distinct, the Hamiltonian is not a product of Hamiltonian. It's not a sum of Hamiltonians. It's indifferent in Hamiltonian spaces. Right? Because we've got this Li phi Li phi. This thing is phi of x n, my, n minus phi of x uh, n minus 1 by 2 the whole thing squared. So while the Hilbert spaces are completely distinct, dynamics doesn't factor into dynamics in the general space. Okay? So this, this way of thinking is not usually the most, at least weak coupling, is not usually the most convenient way of representing uh, representing states in the Hilbert space. It's more convenient to go into a basis that diagonalizes the Hamiltonian, which as you know is a Fourier. <laughs> So the at each point I have a inverse space yes. with the uh, same dimension. Same dimension. And I can find out the so the dimension is infinite. Uh -huh. Yeah. 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 Uh, but I can find out them by uh, the procedure you just said. I just have to find out the harmonic oscillator. Yeah, well, I mean I don't use harmonic oscillator, but yeah, square integrable wave function. Square integrable wave function. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay.
Good. Uh, any other question? Okay, so, so why did I start saying this? I started saying this because I wanted to tell you what is this object? Okay, so uh, I was a little cavalier in the boundary here. So let me. So this object, let's say I integrate from time t1 to time t2. Okay, now in order to make this well defined, I need boundary conditions of this integral. Just like in quantum mechanics, in order to make positive type of well defined, I need the boundary conditions at initial and final times. Okay? I need to say what x was at initial and final times. Because this action, once you discretize it, but not well defined. Unless you know what's happening at the boundaries. Okay? So this object is only well defined if I specify that at t1, I know what the function is. Some phi of x. <coughs> And I have two, two I know this from five two objects. Is this clear? Then this object now is a clear number, and the interpretation of that is phi two of x e to the power minus i h t phi one of x. Well, these states we defined do this. The eigenstates of the object. The yes, the boundary conditions break the noise events because we're asking a question that breaks the noise events. We're asking a question: What is the amplitude for a state defined on this slice to evolve to another state defined on the other slice? Since that question breaks the breaks the noise events, the boundary conditions have to. Okay, but that base, the basic object for of which we're computing, yeah, the, this. The, the fact that there is a basic Lorentz invariant object of Yuri, as you will soon see, will give us a lot of, will, will be very nice. Will easily enable us to derive many Lorentz invariant identities. It's conservation comes, as you see. Okay. So, uh, yes. Uh, so, we are defining, as you said, the inverse space uh, on a slice. Yes. But uh, uh, that will be sufficient only when uh, we have uh, an evolution equation of the functional. Like a Schrodinger equation means the first order in time variable. Right. So, uh, what what guarantees that to be a case? Well, we're doing quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics always has a Schrodinger equation. Um, you see, all that quantum field theory is is souped up quantum mechanics. You take everything, discretize, and then you've got quantum mechanics of a number of large number of degrees of freedom. The quantum mechanics is governed by the Schrodinger. IH bar del psi by del d is equal to psi. Okay? The differences arise in what Hilbert space you are working in. What H is. Okay? And here we are working in a pretty complicated Hilbert space. The Hilbert space, Hilbert space of square integrable wave functionals. And H acting on this Hilbert space could be a little complicated. But we're always doing your quantum field theory is not an extension of classical quantum mechanics. It's a specialization of quantum mechanics. Okay? And so we are we are showing the equation. This is here? Go. Uh so you uh like you pointed out the whatever case we interested like the vacuum will be some a very complicated superposition of these uh, five states. Yeah, we 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 write this down at some point. Yeah. Point is, uh, what if you wanted to write the uh, amplitude for going from a vacuum state to a one particle state? This would be really bad. Well, because you have to, you, your basic object are these three matrix elements. Now, are these matrix elements? But you see, now suppose, let's ask this question in quantum mechanics first. Okay? Even in quantum mechanics, let's say for the harmonic oscillator, the eigenstates of the harmonic oscillator, or any state you might reasonably really want to consider. It's pretty far from position. Yeah. The path ten. So how do you uh, suppose you so you can ask, suppose I was actually interested in psi two e to power minus i h t of psi. Not in x one x two. Then what should I do? Well, you just use the same thing that we always do. That is put an x f x f use some Yeah. Okay? And e to power minus i h d x i x i. Okay? This is the object of 
five minutes to understand. Can I get it? What you have to do is convolute it against the initial wave. And the final wave. Those will be extremely hard. Yeah, what I'm thinking is those will be extremely complicated to write down. Well, those will be extremely complicated to write down. Okay, in the harmonic oscillator, these will be combined for you. Okay? In quantum field theory, if you were really interested in, uh, in computing some finite time evolution, uh, it still would be a bit harder. It's not that hard if you're doing um, It's not like you ever want to do this. It's really do it. Okay, but it's not that hard. You see, um, we'll write this down at some point. We'll write down the vacuum wave function of scalar fields in, in this language at some point. And you'll see, it's not, it's some exponential of some integral stuff. It's not, not too terrible. But let me emphasize one more thing. Path integrals in quantum field theory, and often in physics, uh, have used not so much because the integral is easy to compute. Okay? In fact, you almost never exact, but you you almost never, you never almost never exactly compute a positive thing. Uh, except when it's comes. Okay? Uh, the one exception actually is for supersymmetric things. Where you can use the tricks of supersymmetric exactly compute positive things by telling things. One exception. But you almost never use the path integral, you know, to actually evaluate the integral. Okay? However, the representation of various quantities as a path integral is a device that allows you to transparently see formal connections between the distance. That is the main use of the path integral. Okay? So it's a very useful object to have in your head so that you can understand the properties of the distance. Okay? Actual computations. Of course, you, you, you'll see. Yeah, you, 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 you'll see. The actual path integrals you ever actually compute are basically the same. And then you compound them with perturbation theory or you do other things. Okay? So, right. So, right. Sir, please. Yes. We are slicing up time when we are assuming that at every point there exists a Hilbert space. Yes. So what guarantees are that there exists? Wait, 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 wait. At every time there exists. There, there exists a Hilbert space. At every point of space. There exists a Hilbert space which lives for all time. Okay. So, and we are assuming that there, there exists a state basis out where phi x is diagonal. Are we assuming that? No, no, we are not assuming that. You see, what we are doing is just canonical quantization of this Lagrange. Suppose I give you this Lagrange and I ask you what is the quantum mechanics according to the usual procedure of Lagrange that the classical Lagrangian gives you. What you would tell me is, well, what I have to do, I got m different variables. The variables are x size. Then I set up the classical mechanics and canonical formulation. Okay, and uh, I do the usual correspondence. That will uh, uh, that will give me a Hilbert space, which is square integrable functions of x1, x2, x3, x. Okay. Now this field theory in Lagrangian, once we have discretized, is exactly of this form, where the role of x size is played by phi's at different positions. And therefore, the usual procedure of Dirac correspondence, going from a classical theory to one, okay, tells us what the Hilbert space is. The Hilbert space is the Hilbert space of square integral functions of x of the various points of space. In the example we set up of one dimension, that is x0, x1, up to x0. I say this is it. Phi of this, phi of this, phi of this. Just the standard rules lead us to this conclusion. Okay. Now, what, what is the operator phi? The operator phi acts purely in this interval space. Phi of x0 acts purely in this interval Phi of x1 acts purely in this interval space. Okay. So that these operators commute with each other is automatic from the usual rules. If by assuming you mean, are we assuming that the usual rules apply? We assume. But we assume nothing. Okay? What we're doing is using the usual rules to set up a quantum mechanics, a, 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 a quantum system. Okay? Now, how could that go wrong? It could go wrong in one of two ways. A, it somehow is not internally well defined. B, there's some ambiguity. Okay? The second thing actually often does happen. You know, 
It's something that one uh, should keep in mind that quantum mechanics is a bigger theory than classical mechanics. Okay? So it's usually, I mean, it's often not the case that you can uniquely answer the question, what quantum system has this classical system as a classical limit? There may be many answers to the question, often not. Okay? So if you're worrying about the ambiguity, that's a fact of life. What we're doing here is producing one sensible quantum definition that will have the right classical limit. We address many of this question of the ambiguity further. Uh, then there is also the question that you're asking about, you could implicitly be asking, is this theory well defined? Now, once you've discretized, what we've done is clear the earth. The issue is taking away the Take the continuum limit. This may or may not be well defined, and in fact, it's a very tricky thing to get straight. That's the program, program of renormalization. Okay? Permit me for the moment to discrete it. Then everything we've done is kosher. The question of taking the continuum limit is an excellent question which we'll come to soon. Soon. Okay? But uh, no, not the next lecture. Okay? But, so if your question was about those subtleties, they're, they're deep subtleties. We'll leave. But if the question was about a more elementary thing, we're not making any other. It's just following the usual. Okay? Other questions, comments? Yes. So, uh, this, uh, you said that the Hilbert space at for a single time, the like, Hilbert space at x0 commutes uh, with the Hilbert space at x1. Yes, these are spatial positions. <coughs> <coughs> it's not, uh, actually, even the word <coughs> commutes is wrong. They just, the full Hilbert space is the product of Hilbert spaces. One at each location. You know, operators commute. Hilbert spaces are not Obviously, if you've got a product of Hilbert spaces, and you've got one operator that adds only one of these Hilbert spaces, an identity in the middle yeah. they obviously commute with each other. This is not, you know, some, something that's hard to see. It's obvious. Okay. Uh, those of you who've been in interested in entanglement entropy, this is the basis for that, that whole idea. That it's obvious in quantum fields that the Hilbert space these uh, regarding subtleties, but each. Okay, that the Hilbert space is a pro uh, is a product of Hilbert spaces one at each point in the space. So you can divide an entanglement entropy associated with the region of space, because that region of space is associated with the sub Hilbert space, namely the Hilbert space of all degrees of freedom in that region. Okay, any other questions about? We're just looking at a transition amplitude within one Okay. These two x's? Yes. No. You see, what we're asking for is a matrix element. So let's forget these two. Your question can be addressed just about this. Okay. Right? Okay. So what we're asking for is a matrix element. You see, we've got a basis of states in the Hilbert space labeled by this number x. For any operator a. We can ask this matrix set where x and y are not equal. That's all we're doing. We're looking at the matrix element with x label on one side, y label. Is this clear? Okay? This matrix element enables us to compute the more general matrix element. So any operator, we don't need to work on a basis, we can compute psi 1 on one side and psi 2 on the other side. Right? So that general basis matrix element is related to the special one that's easy to compute by convolution with different functions. Is this clear? Okay, so okay. Um, now so, yeah, well, yes. so, so that particular uh, object which is the amplitude uh, is actually a transition from phi one defining that all x's and t one up to phi two define that all x's and t two exactly. 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 Yeah, it's a, uh, this phi one tells you that operator phi acting on that state is phi one of x at each x. Okay. Now, of course, in general, you would want the analog of the psi two times u, psi u operator. Yeah. 
Knowing this, you can go to this by the convolution. Psi 2 times phi 2 of x, phi 2 of x, u phi 1 of x, uh, phi 1 of x, psi 1. This is some wave functional. This is your Schrodinger wave functional. Sometimes. This is your Schrodinger wave functional for the initial state. Just go take a Schrodinger wave, uh, wave function and do the integral for d phi 1 of x space. d phi 2 of x space. That gives you a transition amplitude between any two states. Is this here? <coughs> but other questions come. Excellent. Now, now let's move on to something a little less uh, straightforward. Um, so we, we want, okay. Uh, as we will see, uh, maybe in the next lecture, or maybe depending on when they come in, uh, as, as, as we will see, um, uh, this path integral representing is very useful to derive many formal properties of the Okay. Uh, it's a very useful thing to have now. So, when we start, you know, we worked out spartan integral representation with the scalar field. We find it very useful. So, we're sort of determined to write down some path integral representation for every, every field theory we study in physics. Oh, we try. Okay. Now, uh, so, mm -hmm. If you try to think about the, 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 the theories that are qualitatively, you know, if you have to do a field with two scalar fields or ten scalar fields, that's the same thing. Okay. Uh, when you have qualitative differences, well, you could have qualitative differences if there's something funny in the kinetic term. Or you could have qualitative differences if you're with firmness. So these are the two problems we're going to address one at a time. Okay. So now, we, of course, we could. We don't want to uh, spend a lot of time dealing with some artificial theory. Uh, so you can ask, is there some theory with bosonic fields that, for some natural reason, has different structure of kinetic terms than we have for, let's say, five scalar fields or four scalar fields? And if you think about it, uh, you know one theory very well that does. This is the theory of electromagnetism. Okay, gauge space. Okay. Uh, so, since you've not, much of what I say just goes through directly about the non abelian theory. But since you've not discussed the non abelian theory, we'll be doing that. Okay? Let's stick to the abelian theory for five minutes. Okay? So, the theory we, uh, we're going to address is the theory based on the action. S is equal to um, let's start with pure electromagnetism. So, Uh, and now I've got the sign of it. Um, and the answer is no, I have not. Uh, let's check. We'll check with it for a second. Okay. Let's define F mu nu first. F mu nu is equal to del mu a nu minus del mu a nu. Eh. Mu and mu uh, indices run over all space and time directions. And uh, we have an arbitrary definition. Arbitrary space time dimension. Okay. Now, now, um, this action has a funny kinetic term. Okay? In order to see, uh, for the purpose of quantization, in order to see by what I mean by this, let's do this time slice. Let me we'll single out zero as special. Okay. If we single out zero as special, we can rewrite this action as F0i, F0i um, times half minus this. Okay. Plus 1 by 4 Fij. Just 
allowing this new index to time. I mean, special, taking out the, the, time, uh, the, the terms in which time appears special. Okay, DDX. Immediately is the bottom. Let's say Fij is del Ij minus del Jij. It involves spatial derivatives of Ij. So this is potential. It's the analog of the V of phi. <coughs> okay? This roughly is the analog of the kinetic. This is del zero a i minus del i a zero with a plus because I write everything lower. Del zero a i minus del i. It's all this thing squared. Why is it kinetic? Is it just kinetic? Why didn't we have a half? You asking? It's because. In this contraction between mu and nu, either mu could be zero or nu could be zero. That is an addition factor. Okay. It's in order to get standard half for kinetic curve that we put the one fourth convention here. Okay. Now, uh, notice here that. This has a del zero a i in the whole thing squared plus half. So the a i is our standard kinetic. But a zero has no kinetic. There's no term that involves time derivatives of a zero. This is obvious if you think about what f is. It, f is completely anti-symmetric, anti-symmetric for derivative of the a, and del zero a zero is not, not anti-symmetric. Okay? So now we've got something interesting. Okay? So the question we're going to ask is the following. Suppose we write down the path in there, but you know, this is such a beautiful action. Such a beautiful action. Um, and we've just learned that one way of defining quantum mechanics is in terms of path in there. Okay? Um, so what we're going to ask is the following. Suppose I, you, you know, you might have been tempted originally. You might have been tempted originally to say, well, uh, if, you, if, you were, if you didn't know about all this first class constraints, of blah, 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 you might have been tempted to say that this, the canonical procedure suggests that this is a very strange action for quantum mechanics. It's not, and you can deal with it, of course. But that might have been your first reaction. However, from the point of view of classical action, it's beautiful. And therefore, it leads to a beautiful path. So what we can try to do is the following. What we can try to do is to say, let us take this beautiful path integral as the definition of our theory and reverse our logic. Let's try to understand what Hilbert space interpretation this path integral has. Does it have the Hilbert space interpretation? And if so, what is it? Okay, so that's the question we're going to address now. So we have e to the power i uh, times uh, minus f mu nu f mu by 4. Uh, this is the this is the path integral we wish to consider, and the question we are going to try to address is what what Hilbert space does this? Is this a path integral that defines the quantum mechanics? If so, and what is that space? Okay, not completely straightforward because A zero does not have the standard kinetic difference. Okay, so let's proceed. So this path integral here is d a i d a z. And because we're interested in Hilbert spaces, we're interested in some slicing, so we're slicing in time. So time and A0 are coordinated. It's the same zero input. Now, um, suppose I looked at this path integral in this way. Because I don't know what to do with A0, I will do the path integral over A0 last. Okay. So I think of it as integral over A0. Times integral dAi. Okay? Exponential of 
Uh, L integral by <coughs> oh, I already said drop. I'm not going to drop H bars. Okay, we restore the damage. This is the traditional thing to do in quantum field theory. Uh, just because it's traditional, it's hard. To, it's hard not to follow your tradition. Okay. <laughs> If it wasn't being recorded, I would. <laughs> <laughs> I would make some comments about textbooks and teacher. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, um, but okay. So, my time's exponential. Of what is it? First, it becomes kinetic term, so integral as an i, uh, d0 ai, and the i and 0, so squared 2, uh, plus uh, minus uh, del i aj minus del j i. And you understand that this is something over i and this is something over j. This is our action. Now, while the full path integral is confusing from the point of view of uh, Hilbert space, if we look at this part, if we look at this part of it, that part looks totally standard. Because each AI has a standard kinetic term. We just want to do a Hilbert space interpretation of this part of the path integral. Okay? We would follow the usual procedure. What would the Hilbert space be? Well, the Hilbert space would be uh, wave, wave functionals, square integral to wave, wave functions, over AIs at each point in space. Each of the d minus 1 AIs, or 3 AIs that we were dealing with, we were living in 4 dimensional uh, what, uh, uh, what, uh Four-dimensional. Uh, next. So, uh, the, I mean, by standard, what do you mean? Here, also, I have a linear term in del zero. We also have a linear term in del zero. But that is not a problem, as long as the action was quadratic in time derivatives. That whole derivation went through. For instance, in quantum mechanics, in the presence of background electromagnetic field, AI, you have a linear term in. In, uh, in, in this kind of, in x dot. Okay? I did deal with it, but it's totally trivial. What was important was that it was quadratic. Yeah. Okay? Now, A0 here is an arbitrary function of space and time. Because we're going to do a path integral over all these zeros. Okay? But this goes back to your question. Tell me about Rita, Rita. This goes back to Rita's question about the harmonic oscillator. He asked if V of x was a function of time, could we proceed to do the same thing? Of course we could. So this object here is going to give us a standard path integral. Uh, it's going to give us a standard Hilbert space for a system that breaks space time symmetry because of some background field. Who cares? Okay? So what is what, so what, what okay? So what is this quantity computed? This quantity, of course, is computing the evolution operator. Okay? And let's go. So, evolution operator, as always, is e to the power minus i h times t. Let's compute what the Hamiltonian for this object is. The Hamiltonian of this space of square integrable functions of ai at each point in space. So, what is the Hamiltonian for this object? Well, we just do standard. Um, Standard stuff. What's the Hamiltonian? The Hamiltonian is pi. That's, so, what's the momentum conjugate to AI? It's clear, right? The momentum conjugate to AI. That's 0 AI minus that I is More precisely, the momentum conjugate to AI at x is this object at x. Okay? And uh, uh, 
and I'm going to deal with, uh, with, with so let's suppose I write this. This is pi i of x, will be this. And uh, we will have the commutation relations a i of y space times pi uh, pi j of x is equal to delta i j times uh, uh, e minus 1 x minus 1. Okay. Uh, the normalization of this, this commutation relation is because the action has little delta x's, which we don't take at all. Is this, is this okay with everyone? Is this okay with everyone? Okay. Great. So we've got the uh, uh, I yeah. Now let's you let's re uh, let's uh, obtain what Hamilton is. Hamilton, what is it? It's integral a is a i dot pi i minus the Lagrangian. Uh, Hamiltonians are supposed to be written in terms of coordinates and moments. AI dot is not in terms of, uh, of momentum, and that's easily fixed. So H is equal to this. H is equal to, let's write AI dot. Oops, what did I do? Um, let's write AI dot as pi i minus pi i plus del i. just from this relation. Okay. So h is equal to integral. Now pi i squared. Now when you work, work out this pi i squared, pi i squared, uh, and then the Lagrangian has a plus pi i squared by 2. So this is now the first problem of the standard. You get pi i squared by 2 plus f i j. This is what I am doing coming to the first but in addition, there's a second term. And the second term is plus del i is 0 times pi. Okay? So what does the path integral evaluate for us? The path integral evaluates for us e to the power i h uh, e to the power i times this object. Uh, Right. Okay. So, but uh, pi i is though they are 
conjugate to AI. Uh, but pi I contain A G, right? So uh, how do I think about so, what? No, but you see, that's not how we should think. That's not how we deal with with the quantity. Pi I is an independent operator. Pi I is the operator that obeys this combination. Okay. But, uh, while writing path integral, these are just numbers, right? I mean, I don't. Uh, yeah. No. So we have a path integral which was this. Yeah. Now what I am trying to do is to understand what that path integral is going to be. Okay. So the claim is that this part of the path integral is computing the evolution operator generated by this analog in the Hilbert space built out of three fields, square integral functions of three fields. Okay, straightforward. No, no, no confusion here. But now, what are we supposed to do? Now, what we're supposed to do is the following. Now, what we're supposed to do is to implement the path integral over AZ. Okay. Now, what does the path integral over AZ do? Provided I'm allowed to integrate by parts. And, well, after <laughs> all, such it will tell you a lot about. <laughs> uh, okay, which we need more. Provided I'm allowed to integrate by parts. Okay. Um, uh, no, actually, I don't, even, I don't even want it. So just let me, let me, let me leave it. Okay, what, 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 what is this objective? Okay. You see, now if I integrate by uh, if I integrate over all A0, something quite interesting is Okay? Um, let me explain that interesting thing with an analogy first. Suppose I had e to the power i times p k, where a is a number, in ordinary quantum mechanics. And I act with this on psi of x. Uh, on psi. Some wave function. Suppose my wave function psi had to show you the representation psi of x. Then as all of you know, this object is the translation operator. Okay? This object is a translation operator. The reason the translation operator is that this object is conjugate to position. It generate translation. Exactly. Um, yeah. So um, so this this object here is psi of x plus a. Now, if I took this object and integrated over all here, what would I get? What I would get is psi of x plus a integrated over all here. If I wrote out the most general wave function in, in Fourier space, let's say we were on torus of it, it's great. If I wrote out the most general in, in integral in Fourier space, then this is a projector onto a particular state. Namely the state that is translation invariant. The state that has zero for your Okay? So this 